Hey everyone, Tree and Monk here. So, you're a DM and you have this player in your group and... How should I say this? You are great. Yep, you've got an optimizer. So today what I want to talk about is, what do you do? How do you keep things challenging for them and for the rest of your group without killing off the rest of your group? How do we make sure that that player doesn't steal the limelight from the other players? How do we make sure the other PCs don't all die? How do we keep challenges challenging for everybody in a balanced way? What should and shouldn't you do as a DM? So let's get started. Graceland, you have anything up your sleeve? More than you'll ever know. Asked to Therix in Rolik from Aoi. Before we get going, I just wanted to thank my wizard and archmage level subscribers to my Patreon. This video idea was given by them, and if you are a wizard or archmage level subscriber, give me video ideas and I'll do my best to make them. And for all subscribers to my Patreon, thank you so much for your support. For those interested in joining my Patreon, there is a link in the video description. So I am an optimizer. Let's talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean. Because these are things I've heard multiple times by players who seek to define optimization as something bad. Uh, the first one, you are trying to win D&D. Yes, challenges are part of D&D and I try to succeed when my character is challenged. I am not sure why any players wouldn't do that. You want challenges to be cakewalks. If a challenge is actually challenging and requires all my skill at character building, at tactics, as working as a team with the other players, and we succeed in the challenge, that's what I love. I do not want to remove challenge from the game. It just so happens that I consider character building part of the challenge. Characters without flaws are boring. You really can't make a character without mechanical flaws. If I want to have a character with a good strength ability score, I'm going to probably have another ability score that's not so good. So there are going to be flaws built in. But even if you could make a character without mechanical flaws, that doesn't mean your character is flawless. Character flaws are not off the table. There is no reason why you have to mechanically self-sabotage your character in order for them to be a flawed character. You want to turn D&D &D into a board game. Listen, I like role-playing. If I wanted to play a board game, that's what I would be doing. You choose mechanics over character. I don't have to choose. I use the mechanics to create the character I'm envisioning. I consider mechanics and character to go together. You only like combat in the game. I like all aspects of role-playing, including combat. That said, the mechanical aspects of D&D are largely geared towards combat. So when you optimize mechanically, it is going to include combat optimization. Doing my best at that doesn't say anything about my opinions of everything that's not combat in D&D. I happen to enjoy combat, and I happen to enjoy other aspects of role-playing. And at the end of the day, if I get up from the table and I had a good time, I don't care if it was a bunch of combats, I don't care if there were no combats. You wouldn't like my game. Sometimes we just role-play the whole night without any fights. I love a game where we do that. Many of my best role-playing memories don't involve combat. Me optimizing my character in a way to make them effective in combat doesn't mean that I won't have a good time when we're not in combat. You need to learn that playing D&D is different than playing a video game. Lots of optimizers, including me, were playing D&D for years before we played video games. Honestly, I would never play a video game if D&D is an option. Enough talking about misconceptions. As a DM, here's what you need to know about your optimizing players. Number one, you do not need to adjust the amount of combat in your game. If your game is combat light, there is no reason that your optimizing player isn't gonna have a great time. Number two, you do need to keep challenges from becoming a bunch of cakewalks. If your challenges are being easily handled by your optimizing player, 
you aren't doing them any favors by keeping it that way. Number three, keeping things challenging does not mean you need to plan against your players. Making everything immune or resistant to radiant damage is not a good way to mitigate an optimized paladin. This is just simply going to replace boredom with frustration. Number four, you do, however, need to ensure that the optimized character doesn't consistently get the spotlight. You can plan challenges to cater to the strengths of the other characters, and you should do that. Number five, if you have an optimizer, it is important that they understand that if the other players don't want to optimize, that's okay too. Watch for players that correct other player character building decisions. Look for the distinction between helping somebody and correcting them. Offering help or advice is one thing, but when phrases like, you need to do this, or you should do this, this is usually a sign of negative behavior and can make other players feel uncomfortable. And should that happen, we need to stop it. So how do we take care of all these things? Number one, if your challenges are turning into cakewalks, ramp them up. CRs are imperfect, but they are a tool you can use. You can also increase hit points, saving throws, chance to hit, add abilities, resistances, etc. It is better to err on the side of caution, though. Run the first combat of the night as per normal. How did it go? Was there any danger? Any excitement? If not, then for the next encounter, ramp it up. One way or the other, start out safe. It is really easy to overcompensate, and as soon as you do, then player characters start to die, and it can really derail your story and the engagement of the players at the table, and it's less fun for you and for them. When we're measuring this, run-of-the-mill encounters should still involve spending resources and or taking damage. It's not necessary that the random group of goblins that attack the players on the road necessarily come close to killing any party members. They don't even necessarily need to be doing any damage. As long as players are using resources, then what it does is for the next combat, they have a little bit less to spend. If none of those things are happening, if there's no resources spent and there's no damage taken, then your encounter is not difficult enough even for a run-of-the-mill encounter. So that's how I measure it. If there is no loss at all from engaging in a combat, then those combats need to be more challenging. And when it comes to a big encounter, they need to feel dangerous. Often, this isn't a matter of watching the mechanics as much as how it feels. Listen to what your players are saying. If they're concerned, they're often talking to each other about that. You don't have to kill any PCs, but it should at least feel like it's a possibility. If your big encounter starts feeling like a run-of-the-mill encounter, you haven't ramped it up enough. And if you have an optimized character at your table, know what that character can do. Watch how their optimization affects the combat. Ensure the combat's going to remain challenging despite that optimization. Let's go through some examples. So let's say you have a character that just does an amazing amount of damage with a hit. So that big tough enemy that was supposed to be a challenge for the entire party ended up going down really quick because this optimized character was doing so much damage. One way we can deal with that is increase the number of enemies. Maybe instead of one big tough enemy, we have a bunch of smaller, less tough enemies. Now that being able to do 40, 50 points of damage in a round isn't such a big deal when we have a whole bunch of enemies with 10 hit points each. Now, if it's a character that has an amazing armor class, I don't recommend giving enemies a higher chance to hit. Instead, increase the quantity of attacks against that character, and what that will do is it's going to add in additional chances of that 20. Or maybe they get targeted with spells. Even if they have great saves, a magic missile doesn't care about any of that. Or have them grappled, or restrained, or knocked prone. Vary up your tactics. A creature is going to learn that a PC is hard to hit quickly, even if it isn't instantly obvious. That brings up the next point. If the enemy notices one character is much tougher than the rest, they may be more likely to attack that character. This is a tool you can use to make sure that an encounter is challenging to an optimizer and not deadly to anybody else. On the other hand, make sure that you give the optimizer and everyone else at your table a chance to be the hero. If you have an optimizer that does a lot of damage. Let them tear up a big baddie with a lot of hit points to shreds. Don't do this every combat, but allow for these moments 
when you are an optimizer and you've built this special character and you found a way to be effective, you want the opportunity to be effective. Give them that opportunity. But we should actually follow the same strategy with non-optimizers. This actually isn't an optimization kind of thing. If you are running combats and you have a bunch of non-optimized characters, you can still find moments in the campaign where those players can be effective. But sometimes if there's only one or only two optimizers in your group, you might have to look at it a little more carefully. Let's say, for example, we have an optimizing player and their character's Hexblade Paladin can deliver 100 points of damage in a round. How do we give other players their moments? Well, number one, we could maybe cluster a bunch of fodder to give a chance for that area of effect blaster to feel heroic. Or maybe enemies at range give a chance for the Eldritch Blaster or the Archer to have their moments. Or maybe create an encounter with shadows in the right place. So maybe the Shadows Monk is the only one who can get to the enemy caster. Or you could give the Rogue a chance to sneak up and do a surprise attack on an enemy, getting an extra round to inflict their sneak attack. One thing we can always do is create a nemesis for a specific party member. Giving them a chance to defeat that nemesis will be especially satisfying to them. And create challenges that give the party bard a chance to convince the local lord to help the party, or a chance for the thief to rob a tyrannical prince, or a chance for the party sorcerer to amaze the locals with their magic. Not every chance for a player character to shine needs to necessarily occur in combat. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about how we might ramp up encounters to make them more challenging to parties that include optimized party members. So in this case, let's say we're running an adventure. And in this adventure, the party has crossed a local criminal organization. Now, one of the encounters in this adventure is that the criminal organization is going to send some thugs to challenge the party members. So it's written in such a way that the thugs are basically going to come along down the street and they are going to challenge the party. Now the party is optimized, so we've done some things. Maybe our tanks are on the front lines, our casters are on the rear lines. Those tanks are going to move up, they're going to block off that enemy from getting any closer. Maybe an area of effect caster is going to move in blast a whole bunch of enemies at once, uh, and these range casters are going to control the battlefield, prevent anyone from getting away. Maybe you have some other area of effects that could be really effective. Uh, and then this might end up being a cakewalk for the party. Now, if we have already gauged the difficulty of encounters, and we already know this encounter isn't going to be tough enough, what can we do to make it tougher while keeping the theme of what it's supposed to be doing for the story? Well, the first and most simple thing we can do is to simply increase the number of enemies. So in this case, maybe instead of having six enemies, we up it to eight enemies. We can do that. That's one way to do it. I'm not sure it's the most interesting method to do it, but it is one option. But there's a few other things we can do. Uh, number one, this optimized party probably has a marching order that's very tactically based. So what if the enemies come in from the other side? Uh, and suddenly, they're next to our party wizards and sorcerers and warlocks. Those casters are stuck in melee, and our tanks are on the wrong side of the combat. Now they have to try to get around and get into the enemies, uh, well, hopefully getting our spellcasters away. This can increase the difficulty of the encounter without increasing the challenge rating. If we want to ramp it up even a little bit more, what we might have are the enemies coming in separated. So they come in from three different sides effectively surrounding the party. Now it's going to be difficult for the party tanks to move at all, and we still have those wizards and sorcerers in melee. Also, we no longer have the enemies clustered, so they're no longer as subject to area of effect. Another possibility is we might have some of the enemies up on local rooftops, and those enemies might be able to duck after their attacks, granting them full cover. This could make it extremely difficult for the party to target them with attack. Certainly, our melee characters are going to have a tough time, and even our ranged characters, if they need to be able to see the enemy or they need to be able to attack without full cover, then that's going to be pretty hard for them. It's going to create a more challenging encounter. Another thing we might do is we might replace one of the enemies. So maybe this enemy here that was a half-challenge rating thug, we're going to change for a three-challenge rating bandit captain. That bandit captain might engage the optimized party member, and then the rest of the party has to deal with the half-challenge rating thugs. And what it can do then is, if that 
powerful enemy is tying up that optimized party member, that optimized party member still gets to feel like a hero because they're taking on the tougher bad guy, but the other party members get to feel like heroes as well because they're taking out the thugs. There are other things we can do as well. Another thing we might do is we might use light to make a challenge more challenging to an optimized party. So maybe we're going to have the encounter occur at night, and maybe these thugs are going to have dark vision 60 feet. Now our party, ignore the tokens here, let's say our party are a bunch of variant humans, because that's one of the things optimizers often do, is make variant humans to get those feats at level 1. So at the beginning of combat, what happens? Well, these enemies who are up on the rooftops use ranged attacks, and they're going to be attacking the party at range within the line of sight of their dark vision. Party, of course, immediately says, who's shooting the arrows? And you say, well, they're coming from outside of your line of sight. And then this is when the party reminds you, we use a light spell. And then you say, yep, yeah, light spell. But the light spell only has a range of 40 feet. So you can tell them it's coming from beyond the range of their light spell. This is perfectly reasonable. The enemies can see the party. They also can see the source of light. So they're able to attack while they're out of the source of light, but still within view of the party. So they're taking their movements, moving up, searching for these enemies, uh, and by the time they see them, maybe these enemies are now back ducked behind full cover. So now they may not even have an applicable target. Then those enemies pop up again on their turn, fire again. This would give even a couple rounds of free attacks for an enemy, never mind the fact that we've tactically placed them in a position that's difficult for the party to hit. And what this does is it creates a new challenge for the party, something they don't normally deal with. Normally combats are, the enemy's on the map, you're on the map, roll initiative, move up and attack. But encounters don't have to work that way. We can do other things to make them more difficult for a party, and an optimized party then has to come up with unique ways to deal with this, and optimizers love this. We love tactical challenges. So that is a list that is by no means exhaustive of ways that we can make encounters more challenging for an optimized party. Uh, and again, if we're going to do this, always err on the side of caution. DMs often don't realize the amount of advantage that a round of surprise gives to an enemy, and it can turn what should have been a run-of-the-mill encounter into an encounter that might even result in party deaths. So like I say, on the first combat of the night, don't mess with it at all. It's okay to have one encounter that's easy, and this gives you a gauge and you can see by how that encounter runs how much you're going to have to increase the challenges that are coming up. And again, err on the side of caution. So maybe the next encounter is a little bit tougher, but it maybe still isn't tough enough. So the next encounter is a little bit tougher. Have it ramp up. That can build tension as well. And then when we get to our big enemy fight, you have a really good idea of how tough that challenge needs to be to challenge this party. So those are some ideas. I hope they're helpful. Again, if you have an optimizer in your party for the very first time, this is nothing to panic about. There's nothing to be concerned about. Optimizers optimize because we love this game. If you want an engaged player at your table, you just got one. Don't treat optimization as the enemy or something that ruins the game. Don't assume that your optimizers don't like to role play. Don't assume that your optimizers only like combat. And don't assume that your optimizers want the combats to be cakewalks. You as a DM can make simple adjustments to make sure that's not the case. So I hope you found this helpful. And again, I would like to thank my patrons for this video idea. And until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. Because D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone, and I'll talk to you next week.